Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. Dissecting and deconstructing once saved, always saved. Now, before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Okay, this is part eight of tackling the hotly debated once saved, always saved bait. Now, What's amazing about this topic, salvation, it is one of the most plainest and simplest subjects in the entire Bible. In fact, the entire Bible evolves around God's salvation, yet it is complicated by men, tradition, opinions, theologies, denominations, okay? And most of it is that it is built upon a faulty theology of works or human effort. In other words, the argument against the, the, the assurance of salvation is that you must do something. Something. Anything. You have to do something. I'm refuting Pastor Vlad's argument. I'm going through his video. Now, keep this in mind, this is a 40-minute video, and we are on part eight. And so we're really unpacking his um, debunking once saved, always saved. And for the purpose of the video, I am once saved, always saved. That is, I believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. Now, the reasons why Pastor Vlad believes that you're not one, always saved it's because what they would do is say, he would say, well, you could give it back. You could walk away from it. You can forfeit it. All of these different terminologies that he used, everything that emphasizes what we must do, what man must do, his human effort. And what is interesting is that he doesn't emphasize the power, the impact, the effectiveness of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Even though he dealt with the verse himself in Colossians 1, 21 through 23. He emphasizes verse 23, the if, but totally dismiss verse 22, which, got, which he says that Jesus has reconciled us to God in his body, by his death, he presented us holy, blameless, and faultless before God. Now, let me be clear before we move forward that this is a disagreement on his point of view on one saved, always saved. This is not an attack on Pastor Vlad, his person, and um, his ministry. And all it is is a disagreement I'm disagreeing with his point of view on one saved, always saved. And at the end, we'll agree to disagree. Now, another thing is, is that I changed my method here a while back of just simply playing the videos and commenting. And these kinds of subjects, I'm playing the video, commenting, but we're also going to the very scriptures themselves. As I said earlier, the argument itself is built upon a faulty denominational point of view of human effort. And as we have been going through what we have been discovering and refuting, that the very, most of the scriptures that Pastor Vlad is using to construct his argument is basically scriptures that have nothing to do with the topic of salvation. I mean this. He doesn't use scriptures, except one, that where the author is teaching on what salvation is. So, for example, in Matthew 24, when Jesus said, he that endures to the end will be saved. Jesus wasn't teaching or talking about, this is how you are to be saved. This is how you're going to go to heaven. So, what is further frustrating is that they never go to those verses of scripture that specifically deal on the topic of salvation. 
Now, I did that in part five and six of the, this series here. So you can go back to those videos on our salvation on, on part five and six. I exclusively deal with those verses of scripture where they specifically teach on the subject of salvation. So with that, and one other thing is because of the popularity of Pastor Vlad, he has over a million subscribers, YouTube may interrupt with ads. And so if that happens, I'll scroll through, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I'll scroll through and hit the skip as soon as I can. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing that is because I'm going straight to the YouTube channel so that I can have side by side. In fact, I'm going to do that now. As you can see, uh, I have this video and then I'm going to have my uh, scriptures that I'm going to use. And we're going to actually go to the scriptures themselves. All right, so I'm going to pick it up in verse number. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick it up where he, where he is, uh, Romans 11. We already dealt with that. I'm just going to point out a couple of other things before we move on, but here we go. Romans chapter 11, verses 20 through 22. But they were broken off because of unbelief. But you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. People say, oh, if you teach that a Christian can forfeit salvation, it brings fear. That's what Paul is trying to get us to have. Fear of God. So there's a couple of things. One, no, God was never trying to get us to have fear of God. I'm going to show you that in a moment. I actually dealt with that before in Romans 8. The other thing is with Romans 11, Paul, remember, is dealing with two classes or classification, the Gentiles and the Jew. He's not talking or speaking specific to uh, specific individuals. Now, this again, this is amazing because remember, Romans 3, 4, and 5 specifically deals on the subject of salvation, which he totally missed. He skips over those essential teachings of salvation to get to Romans 11. That's the error here. Secondly, when he talks about the fear, let me show you one verse of scripture here. Uh, this is Galatians chapter 5. And I look at verse 6 when it says, um, this is bugging me. I'm having te technical difficulties here. In other words, so if you can't see all of what that verse is saying right here, it's cutting off the edge and I don't know why. All right, but I digress. Look at verse 6. Um, well, I, you know what? Let me go back to verse 5. I mean, verse 1. Uh, verse 1 here. All right, it says, Christ has liberated us to be free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. Take note, I, Paul, tell you that if you, if you, that if you get, get yourself circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to keep the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Now, again, is he talking about them losing their salvation? No, he's kind of making a statement right here. He's making a statement that the Jews were trying to get them to keep the law. So he's basically saying, well, if you're going to keep the law, okay, then you're going to be alienated from Christ. If you're going to be justified by, if you're going to be justified by the law, then you've got to keep all of the law. Now he's talking to the Galatians church because there's a contamination of uh the, some of the Pharisees that have kind of crept in. Uh, they were kind of, they, some of them were calling themselves believers. But now watch what he says right here, verse 4. You, uh, verse 3 again, again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised, he is obligated to keep the entire law. He says, you who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. For, th for through the Spirit, by faith we eagerly await for the hope of the righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision accomplish anything. What matters is faith working by love. Now, we don't want you to read that. 
this faith work is by love. Some of you may know it as faith work is by love. Now, a lot of people kind of, again, take this verse of scripture and they use it that, hey, go and make sure that your faith is operating in love. <clears throat> that's not that's not the point that Paul was making here. What Paul was making was that our faith towards God is not under the bondage of slavery, which is fear, but based upon God's love for us. In other words, my faith in God is not that I fear him. I don't fear God in the sense that, and, and, and let me be crystal clear, that the scripture tells us to reverence God. But now when we put the word fear, even if we want to say fear God, but then we put the fear in the sense in the proper context, he's just telling us here that where our confidence in our salvation is not in any way based upon fear. It's not in any way based upon fear. It is based upon God's love for us. My faith works because of his love for me, not because Ooh, I'm really afraid that if, if if I mess up and that, you know, that God's going to strike me dead. And some people have that fear. And this is why he's writing these kind of scriptures right here. So that you won't have fear. You should not have fear where your salvation is concerned. Reverence? Yes. But do I fear God's wrath? Absolutely not. Okay. Not fear of losing salvation. But to not have arrogance, I'll never lose my salvation. I can do whatever the heck I want. Paul is like, no, they were broken up because of unbelief. But you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant. Okay, now I, I dealt with this also, but I'm, I just want to deal with this one thing again when he says that we could do whatever we want. I've never heard anyone teach that. I never even had heard anyone have that position. That because we're saved, we can now go out and sin. I, I've never heard that. I, I, I again, I never heard that. I think, I think it's a straw man argument. I know I'm going to heaven, and the reason why I know I'm going to heaven is because Jesus Himself is a propitiation for my sins. He is the satisfaction of my sins. He himself, remember Colossians 1, he himself reconciled me to God in his body by his death. That doesn't inspire me to go, well, now that I know that, I can go out and sin. I know my wife will forgive me if I were to ever go out and commit adultery because she's a godly woman. She's a godly woman. But does that inspire me to go, because she's the godly woman, I can go out and commit adultery? Never have the thought. She would go amen to that too, by the way. But again, I know she would forgive me, but I'm not, that doesn't say, well, because she, I know she forgives me because she's the godly woman, because she lives by the word of God, I can now go out and have all the women I want. By the way, she would say, no, you can't. <laughs> okay. All right. But again, it's a faulty kind of premise right here. No one, no, no one, no one thinks that. Well, I shouldn't say no one. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Uh, yeah, there may be some uh, demented people that think that, but I would question their salvation if they do, personally. But no one thinks. No one comes to the realizing that I am a sinner saved by grace. That the, the mere what Jesus saved me from was sin, so that I can now go back to sin. Nope. But be afraid. For if God, if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and the sternness of God, the important. sternness to those who fell, but the kindness to you, provided that you continue. Have you noticed that? Continue in His kindness. Otherwise, what? You'll never lose your salvation. No, it says otherwise you will be also cut off. That's Paul in Romans. We're not now. So again, notice he uses the term, lose your salvation. We have to endure in salvation. We can give back our salvation. We can forfeit our salvation. So notice all the different descriptors he gives, uh, how we, can, we are certainly in any way not assured in our salvation. 
And it's going out of his way, right, to tell us, don't even think about being assured of your salvation. Even though he's saying, no, we're talking about assured of salvation. Then what are you talking about? What is the whole purpose of his message? It's to tell you, you better fear, okay? You better walk right, or you better not. How do I get to, to the mindset? And this is something that he doesn't deal with. Because basically what he is saying, he's trying to kind of be, in a, in a sense, sly by saying, no, we, we're going to acknowledge you don't have to earn your way to heaven. But that's exactly what you're doing by enduring to the end. Even if you want to say, you have to, once you get saved, then you have to not give it back. So let's ask the question, in heaven, right? This is a hypothetical question. I'm just throwing it out here for thought. Right now on earth, if I can give back my salvation, or as he say, if I can forfeit my, sal forfeit my salvation, if I don't endure to the end, the end of what, by the way, can I give my salvation back in heaven? Once we get to heaven, just a thought, not a, I mean, just, just a question here. Let's go to more verses. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage <coughs> one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. It's speaking to brothers. It's not Okay, let's go there. Hebrews uh, chapter 3. I'm going to start as I've been doing though in the beginning so that we can get the full context. Context. Okay? Um, and then you get, again, so who is he talking to here? Uh, let's look. First one says, therefore, holy brothers, right, and companions in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, right away, people may say, well, he's talking about believers, born again believers, church folks. Let's see. Verse two, he was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was in all of God's household. Now, remember the book of Hebrews, is dealing, it's written to Hebrews or the Jews. But you can also say that it's written to two classes of Jews. One, those Jews who are saved. But then it's those Jews who should be saved. In other words, they're, they're, they're in the Jewish community. But notice he's going to make the comparison between, in, in the book of Hebrews, he makes the comparison between angels and Jesus. How, in other words, Jesus is greater than angels, Moses, the Levitical law, right? So all of these things he's writing to Jews. Why? Because there was a group of Jews, the group that he was writing to, were Jews that were trying to have it, had their cake and eat it too. They were trying to live on both sides. They were trying to keep the law of Moses. They were trying to be saved by the law of Moses while embracing Christ. So watch the language here as we read. So notice he says that consider Jesus, all right? That's who you consider. And then he says he was faithful, verse two again, to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was in all of God's household. For Jesus is considered worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder has more honor than the house. Now, every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was faithful. Don't remember he's talking to, again, the Jews, right? Moses was faithful. Um, he says, um, now, every house, um, verse 5, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household and as a testimony to what would be said in the future, but Christ, so Moses Christ, 
but Christ was faithful as a son over his household. And we are that household if we hold on to the carriage and to the confidence of our hope. So he's talking to Jews right now, right? So he's talking to these Jews that are being bombed back, bomb, uh, um, uh, bomb back. <laughs> okay. They're being uh, um, um, uh, uh, faced with uh, false teachings. I know, I don't know, maybe it's late. I'm getting the brain freeze here. Um, but anyway, so again, he says, we are, and we are that household if we hold on to the carriage and the confidence of our hope. And again, so the, when, when you have that statement like that, that that kind of if is well if you're Christ you're already doing that this is not a this is this is not the other if <laughs> that says it's conditional because if that's the case then again if we hold on so that, so how do we hold on to it how, how do you hold on what what is he saying that you hold on to well hold on to the carriage and the confidence of our hope okay now, let's see what he says right here. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says to Dave, you hear his voice. Now, why is he saying this to those who are already saved? He says, today, if you hear his heart, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they, all, they always go astray in their hearts. And they have not known my way, so I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. So see the contrast here, especially to the first generation of Jews, none of them made into the promised land. Why? Because of their unbelief. That's why, because of their unbelief, even though the promise was given to them. They never embraced it. They never embraced it. Now look at verse 12. Watch out, brothers so that there won't be in any of you. So here's the warning to those because they were buddying up, right? To this old, they were falling back into the old Jewish system. They were falling away from God's grace. They were being kind of enticed to. And Paul is giving this warning. If you're going to go that way, just like he, he did in Galatians, if you're going to be justified by the law, well, here is your path. And it's kind of, okay, if you're going to do that, but you're all, Again, so those who are saved, those who should be saved. But notice this. Watch out, brothers, so there won't be in any of you an, an evil heart of unbelief that departs from the living God. Just like that first generation, they departed from the living God in their hearts. They built the, the calf, the golden calf. He says, but, but encourage each other daily while it's, still, while it's still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. So what is the sin that he's talking about? Unbelief. For we have become companions of the Messiah if you hold firmly unto the end and the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, today, if you hear his heart, do not harden, uh, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who, for who had heard, for who heard and rebel, was it, it really, all, I'm sorry, wasn't it really all who came out of Egypt under Moses? And who, uh, and who, uh, I'm sorry, and who was he provoked with 40 years? Was it not those who sinned and whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And who did he swear that they would not enter his rest? It was not those who disobeyed. So we see that they were unable to enter because of what? Unbelief. So the only thing here that he is talking about is not talking about losing salvation, but again, unbelief. And what what causes a person to lose? Or can is he saying that a person can lose their salvation? That's, that's not even the subject here. And that's my point. It's not the subject right here. But he's using this to warn us, born-again believers, you better watch out because uh, God's going to get you. All right? speaking to heathens and it says that we have the ability to turn away from the living God. It says encourage each other daily so that we are not hardened because the struggle with sin 
could turn to something where we start actually justifying sin and our heart becomes so hardened that we become dead. We become blind and deceived and we can actually walk away from that confidence that we had. First John. Okay, I'm, now here's a problem that I, I see another problem, of course. Um, when he says, let me go back, because I want you to see this here. Unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. It's speaking to brothers. It's not speaking to heathens. And it says that we have the ability to turn away from the living God. It says encourage each other daily so that we are not hardened because the struggle with sin. Now that's the part I wanted to kind of go back and rehash. When he says we struggle with sin, well first and foremost, what was the warning and to who was the warning in Hebrews? First of all, it was not sin because then you would have to describe well, what sin. Well, he's clear it is unbelief. The warning is don't fall in unbelief. Now, if you're going to bring in the struggle with sin, and as I said, there is a Christian, well, not a Christian movement, <laughs> Christian movement, but there's a movement called deconstructing from Christianity. And what you have is people who are claiming to be once Christians, even grew up in the church, speak all of the Christianese language, the language. They went to church, children's church, right? They played in the, in, 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 in the, in the and they, they sung on the praise team. Uh, they did all of the Christian things growing up and everything. And then they come to a place, I, don't, I no longer believe in God. And, and, and so they, they deconstruct. And there's a, there's a kind of a movement out there. And they become atheists. So the question is that, well, were they born again? See, the, 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 there's a couple of things to understand. The question here is, were they ever a full-grown tree bearing fruit? And they stopped bearing fruit. Uh, did they pass from death into life? And then now we're switching and going from life back to death. Okay, so if you're talking about the struggle of sin, then you have to also look at, well, well, what did God consider sin? What does God think about sin? And remember this, Adam did not do any of the heinous sins that we read from his sin on. He didn't blaspheme. He didn't build a golden calf. He didn't have bestiality. He didn't cheat on Eve, even though there was no one around, right? <clears throat> he didn't murder someone. <clears throat> he didn't murder. <clears throat> he ate fruit. He ate fruit. That's it. He ate fruit. So I want to be careful about, again, how we kind of measure this. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. All right turn to something where we start actually justifying sin and our heart becomes so hardened that we become dead. We become blind and deceived and we can actually walk away from that confidence that we had. 1 John chapter 2 verse 24. See what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. Have you noticed the if? Paul didn't say, well, you've heard things from the beginning, don't be worried. He says, if it continues in you, you will remain. First Timothy chapter 1. All right, um, let's go to 1 John. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 John chapter 1. Um, <clears throat> chapter 2. Now, I'm going to start in um, verse 1. 
Because again, um, he skips all the way down. And this is what's the amazing thing to me, where he emphasizes on something in the sense that scripture is not talking about. So in other words, well, let's go again. The scripture that he read right here was, uh, was the 24? Yeah, verse 24 says, what you have heard from the beginning must remain in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he is, uh, it, this is the promise that he himself has made to us eternal life. And I've written these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Now, let's go back to verse 1 because I wanted you to see, when we see a verse like this, that he's, again, he, he's warning against false teachers, people who are trying to seduce Christians away from the faith, okay? But how can you miss this verse here? Verse 1 says, uh, My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. Now, remember, we, we just kind of talked about that, right? So first and foremost, remember I said earlier, and I said that I've never seen anyone who uh, um, had the notion that the grace of God, the work of Christ, now is liberating me to sin. Uh, I've never heard him, had anybody have that. Now, there may be somebody out here certainly that do, but I, I'm not, I'm, I, I've never heard anybody even express that. That I can just sin. Now, people sin. I've heard people say, yeah, I sin. I'm a sinner. But never, I can sin because I am free to sin. Okay. Um, but let's even go even deeper. That if you're an honest Christian reading the scripture, then this is what you're going to come across. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So don't sin. So that's the first thing. Don't sin. I'm telling you not to sin. So a person in a good in good conscience towards God would never walk away saying, I can sin. So that's the first thing. Second thing he says, but if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is a propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Now, what does the word propitiation mean? Because it is extremely important. First, he says, I'm telling you not to sin, but if you sin. Now, remember, he just kind of went through a whole speech saying, man, sin can make you hard. It can make you walk away. And by the way, the verse 24 wasn't talking about the struggles of sin either. Again, what sin was he talking about? What, what, what was he saying that people were, again, during this time, that there was this movement where people were trying to seduce people away from the faith. And he's simply just making his argument. But watch this. The assurance of our salvation here is the word propitiation means satisfaction. It means satisfaction. Jesus is the satisfaction. That's what he's saying right here. He himself is the satisfaction. God does not look at us. Now think about this in terms of his salvation. God does not look at us and then say, I'm satisfied with what you do. You've done enough works. You held on, you endured. He doesn't look at us at all. We are sinners in God's eyes. He doesn't look at us. So propitiation is he is the satisfaction. Well, what is what what satisfaction? Colossians 1:22. He reconciled us in his body through his death. That's the propitiation. That's satisfaction. God looked at that and said, I'm satisfied with what he did, not what you do. And thus, he himself made us holy, blameless, and without fault before God. 
All right. Verses 18 through 20. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hamanenias or whatever you pronounce his name and Alexander whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now it's interesting. Now I'm going to continue but what's amazing to me is again remember that passage of scripture in Timothy is not talking about how to be saved. So what is the encouragement? What is the exhortation that Paul has given to Timothy to hold on to? Salvation? Because you don't want to go to hell, Timothy. That's not the subject here. Okay, that's not the subject. He says, hold on to faith. So we're dealing, first thing I mentioned is that habitual sin, where a Christian is unrepentant, when the Christian, Christian justifies their sin. But now we're dealing with walking away from Christ, which the Bible again and again says Christians are able to do. And I'm not... Uh, again, if you're going to go down that road, route, how much sin can you do before you fail? How much sin? That's the problem. He says habitual sin. Well, what is habitual? What is habitual to God? As I said, remember, Adam ate fruit one time and caused all of this. Okay? Bringing experiences of singers, preachers, pastors, kids. I'm talking about the Bible today. And we're not taking scripture of context. I'm letting you let the scripture define what it means to you. And it's very clear. Scripture is not confusing. You don't need to know all the Greek and all the Hebrew for it to give its meaning to you. Let's go to John chapter 15. I agree 100% what he just said. He's just wrong in how he's applying it because he has not given us all of the scriptures on the subject of salvation. He's not given us Romans 3, Romans 4, and Romans 5. He's not given us Romans 10. He's not given us 1 John, again, 2-1. He went to the other verse. I agree. As I said earlier, I said in, in, in the last video, I don't think you have to understand and know Greek and Hebrew. I agree. I think you can read the scriptures. The problem is that notice where he's reading all of the scriptures where he's reading have nothing to do with teaching on salvation. He's building his entire argument on scriptures that none of these writers were dealing with salvation. That Paul deal, that he does deal with salvation, but not in Timothy 1. All right, I'm going to stop here and pick it up in uh, part 9. Uh, again, I want to unpack it, so we're going to pick it up in part 9 and uh, again continue on. Uh, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. And uh, again, I want to say that all comments are welcome. We could have a pleasant, healthy dialogue. At the very least, we can, at the end of it, we can agree to disagree. I mean, we can we can agree to disagree. Um, but I'm very open to the back the dialogue. So all comments are welcome. Okay, I'll see you in part nine.